Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Parkway Church. My name is Alyssa. And my name is Tim. And this is Harvey and Penny, our children. We are so glad that you decided to join us this morning. And don't forget to hit that share button on Facebook. If you are joining us for the first time, we would like to extend a personal welcome to you and thank you for joining with us today. Parkway is a wonderful family of Christ followers who live to know Christ and to show Christ better each day. I would ask that if this is your first time, now or at some point today, you text the word welcome to 414-253-8080 so that we can gather some information from you to keep you better connected to us. We ask that you allow us to make this journey with you as each of us discover our God-given purpose. If you would like to give to financially support this work, we ask that you simply text GIVE to the same number listed on your screen and make your contribution online. We appreciate your support and know that you will be blessed in your giving. This is the real life of family, having kids and family and trying to do a welcome with them. So thank you for being patient with us. Now let's get ready to worship. If you're able to, join me by standing to your feet. Be engaged that we are experiencing here. You experience where you are today. So sing loud. Lift your hands. As we worship. And let's enjoy this moment we have by worshiping Jesus together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for today, God. We thank you for this opportunity to worship, even if we're at home. Lord God, we just ask that your presence fill this place and fill the places that are watching right now, Lord Jesus. Let our hearts be opened up to what the word that you have for us this morning. We give you all the glory and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. How many are ready to worship with us this morning? Thank you, Jesus.
please, wherever you are watching from, my God. My God, how great you are. How great, how great you are. Sing it with everything that you have. My God, how great. My God, how great. Your presence. 
desire to have a relationship, not just satisfied with spending time with us as frail humanity, as his failed creation, but rather he would desire relationship. I'm thankful today to understand that he loves me, that he loves you, that he cares about us and that He longs to draw us ever nearer to Him. Thankful for the presence of our God. Today, I know that here we are back to not worshiping together in this great space. We are really in a number of church plans. This morning, I would say to you, we have much to celebrate, for today, we are not just a congregation in one location. We are a congregation of many church plants all throughout the greater Milwaukee area. And I think we should celebrate today maybe a revelation that comes to us knowing that today, this is really what God would have for us in the future. Now, I'm not saying that the future plan is 
that we would never gather together in this space. But is it possible that we have gotten so comfortable with coming to a space and having everything done for us that we're able to just come and enjoy the very beautiful presence of God that we have forgotten that our commission, that our mission requires that each of us would go into our world, that our homes and the places where we live, the places where we gather, that those truly can be places of worship. Those can be places where God can come and meet and fellowship and reach our world. I say this morning, I thank God for today. I thank God for this moment. And I celebrate the fact that you have allowed us to come into your homes to worship God and to celebrate Him, our mighty Savior. I would ask today that if you have your Bibles, that you would go to the book of Luke chapter 13. And if you don't have one of these Bibles with you today and you're holding your smart device, I, I might challenge you just a little bit to take a moment and very quickly go find this Bible. And if you don't have one, come talk to Pastor and we'll find you one, okay? But Luke chapter 13, and we're going to take a text from there. And I have a couple stories I want to tell you today. And I, I want to say I'm so thankful for our children and this moment that we're able to worship together. I would also say to each and every one of our children, today is the last day that you have to turn in your coloring contest. That little sheet that you took out of the IF publication to color and turn in, and you're saying, how am I going to turn that in? We can't go to church today. Well, if you have not turned one in, you need to have it into the church office this week because we are going to award the winners next Sunday, and you do not want to be left out of that. So make sure that you get your coloring sheets turned in so that we can celebrate with you and we can uh, just continue to move forward with what God has planned for that in your lives. Now, I also want to say really a big thank you today to all of our team. What you don't realize, because you may only see the number of people that were on the platform, you only see me, but really today what you are experiencing really required about 30 people. And I just want to say thank you to our worship team, being flexible, being faithful. I want to say the same thing to our band, to all of our camera people, our sound engineer, our projectionist, our, our individual that's back in the room switching everything that, so that you can see everything that's happening. Nothing happens just by accident. The pictures that you'll see on social media, the videos that you'll see on social media, that requires someone to do something and to be faithful week in and week out. And so I just say much appreciation to all of that team that works so tire tirelessly each and every week. And thank you to you for being a part of this service. If you are a guest today, I know this was already extended to you, but again, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to you. This is an incredible church family. We would love to have you as a member of this congregation. And if this is your first time, they put that number on the screen, 414-253-8080, and just text welcome so that we can connect with you. All right, today my message title is this, Ritual or real, a pattern for intimacy. And I want to go to the word of the Lord, and we're going to begin in Luke chapter 13, verse 24. Jesus speaking here in response to a question, and he says, there is a great cost for anyone to enter through the, the narrow doorway to God's kingdom realm. I tell you, he says, there will be many who will want to enter, but won't be able to. For once the head of the house has shut and locked the door, it will be too late. 
even if you stand outside knocking, begging to enter, it will be too late. Even, even in your begging, even if you say, Lord, Lord, open the door for us, he will say to you, I don't know you. I don't know who you are. You are not a part of my family. Then you will reply, but Lord, we, we dined with you and walked with you as you taught us. And he will reply, don't you understand? I don't know who you are, for you are not a part of my family. You cannot enter in. Now, go away. Go away from me, for you are all disloyal to me and do evil. Would you pray with me one more time before we go any further? Gracious Father, we love you and we're so thankful to you for your mercy and for your grace. We're thankful for an invitation to come. We're thankful for an understanding that we have been for, afforded an opportunity for relationship with you, intimate relationship with you. And so today, let your word speak to us. Lord, let our hearts be open to receive what you would say to us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to begin today with, with a story, uh, really a, a couple of accounts. But before I do, let's talk about a ritual. How many of you this morning had a ritual that you went through? Now, not to be too personal with you this morning, but I'll bet most of you got up and the first thing you did was probably use the restroom. Probably. Hopefully, the very next thing you did was brush your teeth. Now, some of you might say, I don't like to brush my teeth right away when I get up because it might put off the flavor of my morning coffee or my breakfast. <laughs> yeah, I would think it would put off the flavor. It would probably make it disgusting. So hopefully you brushed your teeth. And then you have a number of things that you go through throughout your day and you don't even think about them. You half the time don't even realize you're doing them because they have become a part of a ritual that you are doing every day. There's someone that I see nearly every day who has a ritual. They walk their dog across my front lawn and then they walk in the driveway of the church and they bring their dog to the church to use the grass for you know what. But this individual has this routine that they do every single time they come in the driveway. They look at the church and they do the Catholic sign of the cross. They don't know, obviously, what type of church this is. They have a ritual. A ritual that really does nothing. A ritual that brings nothing to them. Now, I want to share a story with you found in the book of Acts chapter 12 that really is an account that shows real relationship and relationship that may at times be a ritual. We find in Acts chapter 12 that Herod, this was really Agrippa the first. He has found that it pleased the people of the day that he would persecute the Christians of his day. Much like the cancel culture that we see today, the people wanted to do everything possible to shut down, to shut up, to put away this message of Jesus Christ and salvation found in him. And so Herod finds James and brings him in and cuts off his head. And he realizes that it pleases the people of his day so much so that he says, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to find Peter and I'm going to do the same thing to Peter. And so the account found in Acts chapter 12 says that he goes and gets Peter and arrests him and brings him to the prison house and he gives Peter to the charge of 16 soldiers. Now you might wonder why one man would require so many soldiers. 
It probably has something to do with the fact that he remembered how this guy escaped prison before and there was a revival that happened as a result of him being in the jail. And so he puts these soldiers on duty guarding Peter. And they put Peter in the cell. Two guards outside the door, two guards inside the cell with Peter. And Peter is chained most likely to these two soldiers. Every six hours, a change of the guard. Because in 24 hours, Peter was going to stand trial and he was going to lose his life. But Peter has this sure confidence in his God. He's not worried about the situation. He's not screaming about the injustice. He's not screaming about how his personal liberties are being trampled upon. You know what Peter does? Peter lays down on the floor and goes to sleep. As a matter of fact, he gets really comfortable. The Bible says that he had kicked off his sandals. I mean, he's laying on the floor. He's chained up to two soldiers and he is sound asleep. Now the other part of this account that's really important is the Bible says that the church begins to pray for Peter. They have gathered together in a place to pray and they are interceding for Peter on his behalf. Peter, he ain't worried. He ain't even praying. He's sleeping. And the Bible says that while they're praying and he's sleeping, chained up between these two guards, that the angel of the Lord appears in his cell. Now I got to believe that if the angel appeared in my cell in near proximity to me, I would notice it. But Peter is out. He is fast asleep. I can in my own imagination think that what is about to happen is nothing short of amazing. And I got to believe that the angel says to Peter, Hey Peter, get up. It's time to go. And Peter, Peter just probably, and keeps on sleeping. And I got to believe that the angel reaches down and tugs at his garments. Peter, wake up. It's time to go. And he's just sleeping until the Bible says that the angel smotes him in the side. It's like, wake up, boy. We got to go. Then Peter wakes up, but Peter is still so unaware of what is happening, he thinks he's dreaming. And as the, as the angel begins to lead Peter out of the cell, he walks past two guards, have no clue what's going on. The chains have fallen off of him. He puts his shoes back on. He walks through an iron gate, which outside of are two more guards, and he ends up in the street outside of the prison. Still thinking he's dreaming. Until, all of a sudden, the angel disappears. <laughs> huh. He wakes up, and he realizes... I must not be dreaming. This must be real. And so he makes his way to the house where the church has gathered and is praying. Let me say this to us today. It is important for us as followers of Christ to have a place that we gather together corporately for prayer. It's important that we pray by ourselves, but there is something special about coming together for prayer. So Peter arrives at the house. There's a gate outside the house which is locked. And Peter arrives and he knocks on the gate. And the people inside are praying. You know, you've been around us when we get to praying, right? If somebody were to knock on the door, we wouldn't pay them any mind. We're making so much noise and we're interceding to heaven for the release or for a miracle. We don't even realize it showed up. Peter's knocking on the gate. I can, I can almost hear, it's kind of like the doorbell at your house, right? Ding, 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 dong, ding, ding. And, and it becomes a little more incessant. Ding, 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 burn. Right? He's hammering on that doorbell. Finally, there's a young lady, a young servant gal by the name of 
Rhoda, who's in the house, who hears it. And she thinks, well, I better go answer the door and find out what's going on. She comes down to the door, opens the door, looks out to the gate, and sees Peter. And is so excited to see Peter that she doesn't even grunt to him and open the gate to let him in. She runs back inside the house and says, Peter is at the gate. <laughs> and the people of God, who have been praying, who have been interceding, tell her there's no possible way it's Peter. Now let me ask you a question today. How many times do we pray and God tries to give us an answer and we dismiss the answer because maybe our prayer isn't real? Maybe we're just going through the motions. Maybe it's a ritual for us. And they dismiss the answer. There's no way God could have answered already. There's no way it's Peter. And she's incessant and she says, no, it really is Peter. <laughs> to where then they say, well, it must be his angel. It can't be Peter. But Rhoda continues to insist Peter is at the door. So finally, the church makes her way to the gate. And lo and behold, the man they have been praying for is at the gate. And they're so excited. And they're making all kinds of racket that they tell. They're hollering. They're excited. And Peter says, shh, you got to be quiet. you got to calm down. Let me tell you what happened. And so at that point then, we find that Peter leaves them. Now, let me just pose this to you. Is it possible that there are too many times that when we utter our prayers, that we are simply going through the motion and we are not actually expecting anything to happen? Ladies and gentlemen, I would challenge us. Boys and girls, I would challenge us. When we pray, we need to believe that when we ask God is going to grant that when we lift up our petitions that not only does he hear but he will respond on our behalf. Let me, let me give you another example found in the book of 1 Kings chapter 18. Very interesting story here as well. Elijah the prophet has declared that there was going to be a drought in the land. He had declared that there was going to be no rain and as a result, there's three years of this drought that's going on. And, and it has caused the people much suffering. And, and the king is upset. And he is hunting for the prophet to kill him. And the word of the Lord, the Bible says, comes to the prophet. And he says to Elijah, go and talk to the king. Show yourself to the king. And so the, as the story goes... Elijah shows himself and there becomes this competition. <laughs> I love these competitions in the Bible. Elijah comes to the people. Now you have to understand the reason why the rain had stopped is because the people had turned away from their worship of God and had become immoral and sinful and were worshiping an idol. An idol by the name of Baal. And so Elijah comes and he says, I'm going to challenge the prophets of Baal to a competition, to an exercise, if you will. He said, let's see which God will answer by fire. Now he says to the people, how long will you halt between two opinions? How long will you be confused and say, no, I think we want to serve an idol. No, I think we want to serve God. He says, how long is this going to take? Would you just make your mind up already? And so here is this challenge. And the challenge is, we're going to see which God will answer by fire. So he tells, says to the prophets of Baal, you can go first. And so as the story goes, they build their altar and they put their sacrifice on it and they begin their incantations and they begin their screaming and hollering and nothing happens. 
And the prophet says at about lunchtime, a few hours later, he says, you know, maybe, maybe he's went to the bathroom and he can't hear you. Maybe you should yell a little bit louder. Maybe, maybe he's went on a journey. Yell a little bit louder. <clears throat> and so we find that the more the prophet begins to poke at them and prod them, that they work themselves up into a frenzy. Until the prophet says, maybe, maybe he's sleeping. And if you would yell a little bit louder, he would awake and answer your prayer. To which the Bible describes an absolutely disgusting and a terrible, troubling scene. These people work themselves up into such a frenzy and they're dancing and thrashing around this altar of sacrifice. And they're cutting themselves and there's blood everywhere. Yet nothing happens. And finally the Bible says about the time of the evening sacrifice. That Elijah says it's my turn. And Elijah finds 12 stones to represent the 12 tribes of, Egypt, of Israel. And he calls for wood and there's wood put on the stones. And the sacrifice is put on there. And then he... He calls for four jars of water to be dumped upon the sacrifice. He had dug a trench all the way around the sacrifice. And as they soaked down the, the sacrifice, he says, that ain't enough. Do it again. Here comes four more big jars of water. And they pour them on. And he says, you know, that's still not enough. And they do it again until they have completely soaked the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the ground, and the trench is filled with water. And I want you to listen to this prayer that Elijah prays. Elijah then comes to this place of prayer at the time of the evening sacrifice. And he says, Lord, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. And the Bible says when he finishes that prayer, that fire descends from heaven. It consumes the sacrifice. It consumes the wood. It consumes the stones. It licks up all of the water and all of the dust that is around. And the way the story goes is the people turn their hearts back to God. And the prophet says to the king, I hear the sound of rain coming. Remember, there had been no rain. He says, rain's coming. There ain't a cloud in the sky. It ain't rained for three years. And he tells the king, get yourself to Jezreel because there is an abundance of rain that is coming. And the king leaves in his chariot to begin his journey to the city. And the Bible says that the prophet goes up on the mountain and begins to pray. And you should go and you should read this story, but... What happens is they pray and he sends out a servant to look until finally they see a cloud about the size of a man's hand that begins to rise out of the sea. And he says, that's rain. It's coming. And the Bible says that the old prophet gathered up his garments and began to run with supernatural strength to where he overtakes the king in his chariot and beats him to the city and here comes the rain. Now let me ask you this question. Would you have ever made a proclamation like that prophet? Let's have a test. Let's see who the God is that will answer by fire. And the one that does will serve him and him alone. 
Would you have had the confidence that you had heard from God and then stepped out in faith expecting that it would come to pass? You see, we, we struggle to do that. Because we want these tangible moments of the move of God all around us. We want to see God move. We want to be able to touch it. We want to be able to explain it. But ladies and gentlemen, let me just tell you. You have a tangible representation of the fire of God if you've been filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And you and I must get to the place that we allow that fire of God to be raging within us that when God would have us to do, we would simply step by faith. You see, this is the very first thing that's required in the pattern for intimacy with God. You see, it's important that we pray. It's important that we would make our requests known to God. It's important that we would speak these things to God. But if we don't have the very first thing, it doesn't matter how much we pray. Jesus makes a statement and he says, be not like the hypocrites and do not just simply speak vain, repetitious words. See, ladies and gentlemen, what is required of us in order to have this first peace that leads us to intimacy is faith. The writer of Hebrews makes this statement and he says that it is impossible to please Him without faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Let me read this to you in another interpretation. It says, and without faith living within us, it would be impossible to please God. For we come to God in faith knowing that He is real and that He rewards the faith of those who passionately seek Him. You see, when I get to the place that I pursue God because, one, I know who He is. It's not that He might be able to take care of my situation. It's not that He might be in control. It's not that He might be enough. It's this understanding that no matter the situation, no matter who I am, no matter what I am facing, God never changes. And He is always more than enough. He is abundantly more than enough. He is exceedingly more than enough. Let me give you this today. The greatest miracle that you or I could ever experience in our lives is the miracle of new birth. It's the miracle of salvation. It's not the healing of blind eyes. It's not the healing of cancer. It's not the raising of the dead to life. But rather it's experiencing that my life, which was once trapped in sin, has now been moved to a place of freedom, liberty, and life. Ladies and gentlemen, my prayer life, must be more than simply a ritual. It must be more than just words that I say. The words that I pray must be more than just some mantra that I have heard somebody else say, that I've read on paper, and I repeat it. It must be that I have a relationship with God that has been born out of time spent with Him in times of prayer. Because I know that He's faithful. That I know that He's able. That I understand that there's nothing too hard for Him. That I understand that there's nothing that is impossible for Him. So today I say this to you and to me. Families, There are many times that we pray and we wonder why 
certain things do not happen. I would remind you of this very important fact. God, having saved me, is not a vending machine of whom I am able to go to and make demands expecting that whatever I ask for, I would receive. The scripture makes it very clear that if I pray according to his will, if I pray in such a manner that it lines up with what he is wanting to do, it happens. I have got to be able to see beyond who I am to be able to see what it is that God is desiring to do. And if I can do that, I move beyond the place where the normal people would be. You see, because when Jesus said, in that day, the master will close and lock the door. And no one will come in. It reminds me of an account found in Genesis chapter 7. When Noah had built his ark, and God tells them all to go in the ark. And once they're in, God closes the door and no one was able to go in. And it began to rain and the fountains of the deep opened up until all living things on the face of the earth were destroyed. I want to make sure that my prayers are not simply a ritual that I perform. I want to make sure that the things that I do in my life that I equate to relationship are not just rituals that I go through to be able to tell myself I'm a good person, I do these things. But rather that there are things that happen in my life as a result of my falling in love with Jesus, of coming to a place that I understand who He is and what He's done for me, and that I have this sure confidence that my life, when squarely placed within His will, will be protected, will be provided for, and that there is a plan that is beyond this life that He will take me to. See, it begins with this understanding that there is truly nothing too hard for our God. And secondly, that though we we're fashioned and shaped in iniquity. Though we are fallen humanity, though we are sinners, this same God that we're talking about came to call us His children. Why would I, as the child of the living God, why, why would I not want to have true intimacy with my Savior. So today I would, I would challenge you. We are going to allow some time here at the end when I conclude with prayer for you to gather together as your family by yourself, whatever the case might be, and spend some time in prayer. But it begins with this. It begins with a recognition that there may be a lot of things that I have done that I am doing they really are a ritual, and they're not real. They don't come from my heart. They don't come from a place of intimate relationship with Christ. As a result, this requires that I would repent, that I would ask God to forgive me, that I would ask that God would restore me. See, it's in this place of awareness of my frailty. It's in this place of understanding who I am and my desperate need for a Savior that I turn back to Him. And in my turning back to Him, He begins to build my faith. He begins to build my confidence to where I am able to stand sure that no matter what comes in my life, whether I'm chained between two guards, I can sleep at peace because I know He has me. Whether it's the culture of my day trying to cancel everything that is good and holy, 
I can stand up with a boldness and declare righteousness is still the best way. Holiness is still the way that pleases God. And you must repent or you will perish. You see, that happens when I turn my heart back to God. There's no one greater. There's no one who loves you more. There's no one who desires to use you more than God. And so today, let me close in prayer. And I would challenge you, take the time today. You have time. It's been snowing out. There's really nothing to do. You, you can go out and build your snowman. But I would challenge you. Take some time and be intentional. And make sure that your relationship is real and not simply based on rituals of things that you do. Would you pray with me this morning? God, again, we come to you with a deep appreciation of your love for us. We know that we're not worthy. We know that we don't deserve it. But God, we are so thankful that you would extend grace, mercy to us. That you would love us with an everlasting love. That in our weakness and in our failings, in the times where we professed our love for you, yet we were simply going through the motions. God, you, you challenged those in the Bible when you would say, with your mouth you do profess your love for me, but your hearts are far from me. And God, I know that there have been times in my life where I simply was going through the motions. God, today, we repent of this. And we say to you, restore us. Make us new. Cleanse us. Purify us. Bring us back to this place of right relationship with you. God, we want intimacy with you. We don't want to know about you. We want to be known of you. Have your way in our lives, I pray. Bless each and every one that is a part of this today. Meet them in a special way in this time of prayer. In Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. God bless you. And please, find a place to pray. And Omega said, We worship you, our Lord. You are worthy to be praised. Sing it again. You are Alpha and Omega.